So I have uh, the pleasure and the honor of introducing our governor, John Kitzheimer. Uh, this is, of course, a bit of a challenge since he's a governor that we all know well. And trying to think about this and come up with something new is a, is, is a difficult task. However, I was shown an article that uh, allows me to share some news. Governing Magazine uh, has just announced that our governor is one of the top public officials of the year. One of the interesting comments in the magazine is that the governor has fostered a remarkable series of bipartisan achievements that Washington could only dream of. And I think uh, you heard the other part of that team out here earlier as to why that's been able to happen in Oregon. The magazine points out that when the governor took office, he confronted a $3.5 billion revenue shortfall, as well as a house that was evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans. In Washington, D.C., that would have been a recipe for gridlock. It doesn't even have to be evenly divided. In Salem, it became the basis for a remarkable series of bipartisan achievements on education, health care, and economic development. The article goes on to highlight the accomplishments of the past year, noting the success in reducing our pension liabilities by one-third and the new investments in education. I would note that these achievements include a whole series of Oregon business plan priorities. What distinguishes Governor Kitzhamber is his readiness to try new things. The magazine points out he's willing to take risks, to innovate, and to sometimes fail, and that is a good thing. From my perspective, what our governor represents is an old-fashioned Oregon value. Respect for opposing points of view and a willingness to engage in constructive debate to find solutions. That's a value that's too rare today, and we are, we are really blessed by having someone lead our state who has that value. Governing Magazine has discovered what those of us working on the Oregon business plan know so well. From his first day in office, literally the first day, he invited this group and, and uh, the business associations to come to Salem to work on job creation strategies. We witnessed a remarkable collaborative spirit, a governor who works not just across party lines, but in partisanship and partnership with the private sector. From the business perspective, he really has changed the tone at the top. Working together this past year, we addressed PERS, invested wisely in education, and we're getting very close on the bridge. So at this point, I'd like to welcome Governor John Kitzhaber. Uh, Governor, they have us in these comfortable chairs on the idea that this is going to be a coffee table chat. So. <clears throat> I'm going to start out by uh, asking you to make a few remarks because I know you had some comments that you wanted to lead off with. Well, I'd like to um, just reflect uh, over the, the past three years. The first of one of these conferences I came to was in 2010, and, and as John said, we had an unemployment 2% you know, higher than we have right now in this very closely divided legislature and, and a, an enormous deficit, and I think a fairly polarized state at, at, as well. And you know, what is really remarkable is that we had the Oregon Business Plan. We actually had a blueprint that gave us a frame and a context for many of the things that we did. And we had a tremendous group of legislators and leaders on, on both sides. If you think about what we've done in three years, we have obviously did erase the deficit in a very uh, civil way that resulted in getting our uh, credit rating increased from AA to AA plus at the bottom of the recession. Uh, we have created 60,000 jobs. We've reduced unemployment by 2%. Uh, we had the uh, second fastest growing state economy in the nation in 2011, the third fastest last year. And we've done some very remarkable things in education. Uh, the speaker spoke to one of them. We've revamped our entire early childhood uh, system. 
to try to ensure that all of our children, regardless of race, uh, regardless of geography or income or home language, are ready to learn when they get to kindergarten. I think that's probably the most important investment that we can make to create the kind of workforce that we heard uh, about uh, earlier today. I think the healthcare changes we've made are going to be truly revolutionary. We're obviously uh, experiencing some white water right now, but we shouldn't confuse the website with the exchange. On January 1st, there will be well over 100,000 Oregonians who don't have health care today who will have very good health care uh, in January. And that is a huge accomplishment. And they're going into coordinated care organizations that have reduced the rate of medical inflation by 2%, which is saving hundreds of millions of dollars for Oregon. So I think the question really is, what do we need to do going forward? And I think there are several things. First, we need to continue to implement the education reforms that we've, uh, we have uh, addressed. Uh, we need to uh, continue to move our health care reform into the private market so we can save those, those dollars, I think, for our, our private sector businesses as well. And I think uh, we need to address the fact that although we have created 60,000 jobs and we need to create another 60,000 jobs, by and large, many of those jobs are at the top and the bottom of the economic ladder. And so the next phase of Oregon's economic recovery has to seek to ensure that we reach out to all Oregonians and that we try to uh, uh, stop the wage stagnation that's really eroding the middle class and, and widening the income disparities and the opportunity gap. Uh, and quite frankly, leaving a whole generation of Oregonians with a very real prospect of having a lower standard of living and a shorter lifespan than their parents. So it's a very real issue and it's a very, um, rewarding and, and actually humbling to be part of an organization that has put on the table not only an abstract goal of reducing poverty, but this year has produced a Pathway to Prosperity paper that tries to take that and turn it into an action plan so that we can you know, make sure that everyone in this state really has an equal opportunity to enjoy the prosperity that, uh, that all of us uh, deserve. So thank you for being here. Thank you for letting me be a part of this uh, great adventure. Thank you very much for those remarks, Governor. I, I think, uh, given your announcement earlier today, this all becomes extremely relevant going forward. So one of the things I'd ask you is, how do you see your strategy for business development and job creation that comports with that going forward? Well, I, I think the strategy is the Oregon Business Plan. I mean, it is a document that has evolved. It has not been a, a, a static. Uh, th two years ago, two and a half years ago, you didn't have a poverty goal. We had a job creation goal, and I think if the only question we ask is how many jobs we create, we don't have to worry about who gets them, where they are, how much they pay, whether they're connected to pathways, or what the environmental cost is of getting them. So it's just very impressive. And I think the, the keys are built into the plan. Obviously, we start with continuing to do the big things, continuing to make sure we develop a world-class system of public education and a workforce system that provides the, the skills that our industries need. Uh, that we continue to reduce the cost of health care, reduce the cost of social dependency, reduce the cost of public safety, so that we can reinvest in the enterprise of, uh, of, of education. Uh, uh, secondly, I think the cluster strategy is a very robust strategy that we should cling on to and continue to, uh, continue to expand. Uh, we heard a lot of the themes, I think, already today. Innovation is absolutely key. It's not just innovation with uh, 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 well-known innovators like Nike in the, in, in the, in the sports uh, uh, space or, or Intel, the amount of innovation that goes on in bigger industrial, I would argue probably within Schnitzer Steel uh, to, or uh, uh, precision cast parts, to stay competitive in this world is huge. So continuing to foster an environment uh, that puts a premium on innovation and making sure that we adequately invest in our, our universities and in our signature research centers, I think is, a, is another key. Um, I have asked David Chen, actually, in response to a comment I made a year ago about innovation in the wood product sector and in agriculture. I've got him busily working on some recommendations that can maybe build on some of the suggestions we heard from the, uh, the conversation uh, uh, earlier, um, earlier today. Uh, and I guess the final um, piece of this, which is obviously controversial, I do think it's time to take a much more thoughtful and intentional look at our revenue system. Um, both in terms of, of its stability, which is, I think, probably its single biggest problem, its lack of predictability for financing public services, and to some extent for the business community, that we have not in decades really asked ourselves, are the incentives and the aspects of the tax system aligned with what we want our economy to look like 10 or 15 years from now, rather than what it look, used to look like? Uh, and I think on the other end of the spectrum, we have to ask ourselves about the 
balance of, of, of social support services and our tax system as it affects income, uh, it, the ability of people to actually get out of poverty. As you know, as you start making more money, you begin to lose your, 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 your housing support or your food stamps. Uh, and if you look at our, our, our tax code and overlay those things, an individual who's moving from 30000 to 35000 has a marginal income tax rate of 93%. Now, that's a huge disincentive for doing exactly what we want. So when we talk about tax reform, we have to do it sort of writ large, uh, and I don't think we have time to go into all the aspects of that today, but it's got to be on the agenda, and it's my intention to uh, uh, put it squarely on the, on the table. Well, that's very good news. One of the other things we talk about is the export-related nature of our economy and the importance of those jobs. Uh, part of what really runs the export economy is our ability to, for trade and the infrastructure that supports it. And uh, I'd like to hear your comments about what you think we need to be doing in the infrastructure area for, for your uh, forward look here. Well, I think uh, we know that Oregon is one of the most trade-dependent states in, uh, in, in, in the country. And so there's a, a number of things we're doing today that I think uh, are, are uh, very important to continue or develop. We had the STEP program, which is now, I think, the, the uh, trade promotion program. But we had an initial investment of about $438,000 in matching grants, and, and it generated uh, $28 million in new revenue from small businesses who are actually able to access uh, a trade shows and trade promotion uh, options. So we need to really continue uh, to, to do that. I think one of the clear pathways for some of the small businesses that are about to become big is developing access to these very large markets, particularly, uh, particularly in Asia. Uh, in relevance to the comments we heard earlier about the natural resource sector, and particularly uh, Patrick Kreitzer's comments about a, a food uh, cluster, uh, Oregon, I think, continues to be the only state that is uh, authorized to export blueberries into the Korean market, which has grown from, I think, 1.1 billion to, uh, uh, to about 2 billion over the course of a year. So there's some huge uh, opportunities, I think, for our natural resource centers in that, in that traded sector uh, um, uh, of space. I think one of the issues that's very troubling to me, and I've been involved with it, although somewhat behind the scenes, is the whole uh, the specter of losing our cargo right. uh, uh, business out of the port of Portland, which would be absolutely devastating. Uh, um, some of our lumber companies, I could mention a few of them, that uh, uh, make specialty lumber that is almost exclusively uh, exported to, uh, to uh, China. If uh, that, those materials have to be trucked up to Tacoma or Seattle, they're going to be put at a severe competitive disadvantage, and those are creating jobs in rural parts of the state. Uh, so that's a very serious issue, and we're working very closely with the port, uh, as well as with the terminal operator and the unions to, to make sure that we don't lose that important uh, piece of our uh, international infrastructure. And finally, I would simply say uh, support for the overall operation at the Port of Portland is, is absolutely uh, uh, critical. It is our, it is our window. Uh, to the uh, world economy, making sure we maintain those direct flights to Asia, the direct flights we have to Europe, are, are hugely important for our economic future. And I can't go past infrastructure without asking you a question about uh, the bridge. The bridge. So here's where we are on the bridge. Uh, I, my biggest concern is that we decide by not deciding. Uh, I know that there are controversial aspects to this project uh, and uh, some legitimate issues that have been raised since Washington failed to make its appropriation, but let me start by saying this is not an Oregon uh, goes it alone project, it is an Oregon led by state project. The treasurer sent us a letter in September that said essentially that this Oregon led by state effort is financially viable at current interest rates, even under the most pessimistic toll projections, if six criteria were met. The first one was we had to get a bridge permit from the Coast Guard. We've got the bridge permit. The second one is that we needed the uh, Washington and Oregon Department of Justices to indicate that this was legal, the framework was legal, which they have done. Third, we needed to have a dedicated and identified source of light rail operational funds on, in Vancouver, Washington, which was ratified at the election in November. We needed to have uh, $850 million from the transit uh, 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 Folks in D.C., that money is still in the queue. We needed authorization to get a $900 million TIFIG loan that is in progress. And the last element was a uh, construction and toll reciprocity agreement with Washington, which we're negotiating. We need a public hearing. The uh, Senate President has assured me we will get a public hearing in uh, January. The Treasurer needs to uh, appear at that. Uh, the Governor's Office, if not the Governor from Washington, needs to be there. And the Legislature then, the Legislative Committee, Joint Committee, it's a very good committee, needs to make a recommendation one way or the other to the legislature. 
Uh, I think that it's, it is a project of such importance, uh, whether you support it or not, that if we're not going to do it, we need to, need to make a conscious decision that we're not going to do it. And if we're going to do it, which I think we should, we need a recommendation to the legislature in 2014. Well, I know this group and the Oregon Business Plan uh, really supports you on that. Uh, it's been almost 15 years since I submitted my proposal for the bridge, and uh, it's been a long slog without not a lot of forward progress. It's been a remarkable year, so congratulations on that. Well, you know, it's like uh, we started this with a, a letter between Gary Locke and I, an interstate agreement. It was three governors, Washington governors ago, by the way. Uh, and then I left office, and it's sort of like a, a Rip Van Winkle experience where you go away for eight <laughs> years, and you come back, and the project's still not done. It's costing a lot more money. But, uh. <laughs> so uh, can we talk a little bit about small business and how, what we can do to encourage that and, and how important that is to what we said today about rural Oregon and the needs in rural Oregon? I think, you know, I think that think the challenge with talking about small businesses, it, it is, it, it is, it's very hard to quantify small businesses because they're such an enormous part of our economy. Businesses of less than 100 employees are well over 50 percent of all uh, employers uh, in, in the state, and that's disproportionately true, I think, in, in rural Oregon. I think, obviously, uh, some of the things that we can do to, to foster small businesses is giving them economies of scale, uh, that is, the, the incubators, the technical support, the, the, uh, the help in marketing, like the STEP program. Um, and I also think that um, there's, an inter there's a relationship, which you, as, as uh, your role at the business plan, understands, but there's a relationship between the, the um, viability and, 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 and uh, growth of small businesses and the big trader sec traded sector businesses, which provide higher paying, very stable jobs, but then create indirect jobs through their supply chains and induce jobs through people going to bakeries and, and, using, and, and, and banks, et cetera. So there's a relationship there. I think the area that I would recommend we focus on is that smaller subset of small businesses which are about to become big businesses. And that's where an awful lot of the job growth in Oregon comes from. So taking some, um, some time and intention to try to better identify and figure out how to support that subset of small businesses I think would be very, very uh, productive. And, and in terms of supporting those businesses, the small ones that have the potential to become large ones, uh, one of the aspects of that has always been do we have enough uh, innovative platforms in Oregon, and do we have capital access? What, do you have some comments on well, that? Well, I think that you know, on the innovation side, and we've heard that theme throughout today, uh, we, 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 we do pretty well. We could do a lot better. The, in, in, uh, the uh, Oregon Innovation Council, for example, uh, has created, I think, about 26 companies uh, through, through its, its innovation, its research, and its support. We've got BEST, we've got ONAMI, we've got some very, very good uh, uh, university-based research centers, which uh, we, we have increased their funding, but we could certainly make a larger investment there. I think uh, that I, I mentioned earlier, really uh, stepping up and, and being much more intentional in terms of supporting innovation in agriculture and in the wood products industry would also go a long way towards helping us in, in, in rural parts of the state. And continuing to foster better relationships uh, between, and we heard some of the um, um, comments today, uh, between the, our universities, OHSU and Intel, for example. And I think the, um, the uh, great opportunity we have here, we also heard Dr. Drucker talk about it, is the $500 million uh, Phil and Penny Knight uh, challenge. So assume we have a billion dollars. Um, I think the challenge there is to figure out how you leverage that. If we can leverage the small $15 million investment in or the Oregon Innovation Council to 26 companies, can you imagine what we could do with a, a, a billion dollars well spent? And I'll just add this, and I don't know whether it's feasible or not, and I had this conversation with Joe Robertson and Dr. Drucker when they came down to Salem, hat in hand. Um, <laughs> you know, just a look, I want the state to, to be in a little bit with the infrastructure, which I'm sure we, we will. There's got to be a way to figure out how to take some of that research and spread it around the state of Oregon. There's got to be a way in this day and age uh, to, to try to figure out how to leverage that uh, billion dollars, uh, obviously, to move upstream and, and, and address the, the, the causes of cancer, uh, which Dr. Drucker eloquently uh, suggested. But in the process of doing so, create economic activity that's not just at the south waterfront, that's in the waterfront in Coos Bay. Uh, that's maybe somewhere in eastern Oregon. I don't know what that looks like, but there's an opportunity, it seems to me, for us to think about how to take this incredible gift and this incredible opportunity and leverage it into not only um, curing cancer, but addressing that third uh, goal of the uh, Oregon Business Plan. 
Yeah, well, that leads to uh, one of the comments that people have made about our experience in Oregon with uh, incentives and subsidies and whether or not that's something that we've learned some lessons from and what your plans are about that in the future. Well, having just signed an agreement with Intel, uh, I, I plead guilty. Um, I think that it would be nice if every state would, would disarm and that no one would, would compete for, for businesses. I think that's unlikely. So I think the challenge is how do you develop incentives that um, are highly targeted to the industry you're trying to, to, to help and don't sell the farm? I think with the tapering off of the Betsy, which uh, was, a, was a real problem, we have an opportunity to rethink, I think, our whole set of incentives here uh, in, in the state of Oregon. Uh, and uh, I think that should be one of the things on the, on the agenda of the Oregon Business Plan going forward. I will say, however, that there is no incentive that can make up for a poorly educated workforce. There's no incentive that can make up for unreasonably high and escalating health care costs. Uh, there's no incentive, I think, that can make up for loss of the natural wonder, which is one of the things that attracts people to Oregon as well. So when we think about incentives, we need to think about the economic side, be very intentional and targeted there, but we also need to think about sort of the fundamentals, the basics that we're doing quite well right now that are uh, also very important incentives. Well, one of the things that we talked about uh, during your transition after the election was the business environment in Oregon, and true or not, the, the view of many people that it was a negative business environment. Uh, can you comment about how that, in your view, has been addressed? Well, I think you have to change the tone at the top, which is, I think was your first recommendation to me is, uh, right after I got elected. And I, I think we've, we've tried to do that. I think the legislature has contributed enormously to changing the tone. That is a state where the legislature and the state government is about getting things done, uh, not to bickering on, on, on partisan lines. I think the, the stability, the, the changes we, we made to accommodate both uh, Intel and Nike, which did not cost the state uh, anything, but provided that, that certainty, that stability, is, is very, very important. Uh, and uh, I think the work we're doing on the regulatory reform, uh, regulatory streamlining, is another one that provides that, that certainty for investment. Uh, and uh, the work on the regional solutions, I think, is, a, is another that really begins to focus on regionalism and re regional priorities. I do have to say, though, that I think it's important that we not become uh, uh, prophets of our own bad news, or propagators of our own bad news. Um, we need to tell the story that we don't have a bad business climate in Oregon. Ask Nike, ask Intel, uh, ask Daimler Trucks, ask Garmin, ask Pioneer Seed, ask Schnitzer Steel. I mean, there are things that we can do better, but I think that we need to also boast about what we're doing well and the fact that we've had some very significant traded sector companies make a conscious decision to stay here, invest here, and expand here. Tillamook, uh, Creamy would be, would be another one. So let's celebrate what we've done. Let's say we've got do more to do, but let's be very positive about uh, where we've come in the last three years. Um, one of the things that we were trying to do with the format that we had for the summit this year was to talk a little bit about parts of the economy in the state that outside of the urban areas people don't really know a lot about. There's, there's a lot of really interesting and innovative growth that we can build on uh, across the state, including, as you heard earlier, a number of comments about um, the food cluster idea. Um, and I would, uh, I would uh, ask you, what, and you heard, I think, uh, Senator Ferrioli, I believe it was, mentioned some ideas about innovation in, in using incentives in a different way to help uh, some of those things in a rural area. Is that uh, something that has some attraction for you? Yeah, it does. Uh, when I was in the legislature, I represented rural Douglas County for, for 14 years. I guess I still do in a different capacity. And, you know, it's, it's a, a southwest Oregon and many parts of eastern Oregon are, are really disadvantaged because they, they have been a natural resource-based uh, based economy and, and they're having uh, you know, enormous difficulty, which is, I think Greg Cantor mentioned, really does affect uh, all of us, I think morally, uh, but certainly economically as well. Uh, our strengths, I think, are both agriculture and wood products, and I do not believe for a minute that, that uh, you can't have a robust sunrise wood products industry in this state without uh, abandoning uh, uh, long-term environmental stewardship and conservation values. But I do think it requires looking at the landscape in a different way than we have traditionally looked at it. 
I've had conversations with Ed Ray about creating a marine research crescent that would go from Corvallis all the way down to Port Orford. There's, there's the Newport uh, facility, the NOAA facility down there, and that has some extensions down in, uh, in Coos Bay. So there's some real opportunities for, for a, 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 a marine economy innovation uh, and research in that area. Uh, I think uh, Patrick's comment about the, the huge potential of, uh, of creating a much more robust food cluster uh, w w w starting with our uh, natural uh, uh, and uh, tremendously diverse agricultural community would be, would be another one. I, th I think it, maybe it was Patrick that mentioned uh, this idea of trying to parallel uh, the growth and development of our high-tech companies with, with the incubators, right. and with the research, with the R&D uh, would be another very good priority to focus on. Because I think if, if, you know, if, you're going to, if we are going to achieve that third goal uh, of the... Uh, of the uh, business plan, we're going to have to figure out how to lift up uh, rural Oregon, and we're also going to have to figure out uh, how to lift up minority contractors uh, and those who have English as a second language and make sure that this is an economy that benefits uh, each and every one of us. We are perfectly capable of doing it. This business plan is mature. Uh, we've changed it every few years, and this is the opportunity, uh, uh, particularly with some of the new construction and big investments that are coming in, to really, uh, uh, really be true to all three goals of the Oregon Business Plan. Uh, another of the areas that you've mentioned uh, before and earlier <clears throat> in this talk that I think maybe circling back to for a moment is worthwhile is, can you give us a sense of your perspective on where we are and all of the innovative things you've done in healthcare during this first term. What is, how's that working out? I mean, I've, obviously the website issue and the current national problems are not an area I'm, I'm particularly interested in, but you did some things early on, you did some Medicaid things, and I'd, I'd like to hear your view so, on those. First of all, we have to, we have to give the, the, the legislature huge credit for, for that. I mean, they passed what, the foundational pieces of this in 2011 under uh, co-speakers uh, 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 Hannah and, uh, and Roblin and, um, and uh, Senator Ferrioli and Peter Courtney. So, I mean, we need to remember that this was a group effort. But what essentially we've done is we've changed, we're trying to change the care model from one that's focused on sort of after the fact acute care in the hospital or in the emergency room to prevention and wellness and taking care of people with chronic conditions out in the community. That's what those coordinated care organizations do. And we have quarterly reports on their success. They're all living within their global budget. They've reduced the per capita uh, inflation by 1% already. It'll go down another percent. They have seen a significant increase in primary care visits, a reduction in emergency room visits, a reduction in hospitalizations for congestive heart failure, dramatic increase of the number of people who are in pr primary uh, patient med medical homes. So it's, it's really working. And the huge opportunity here is to take that care model and list it on the exchange as a high quality, low cost option for school teachers, for state employees, and for, and for small businesses. And just, just to give you a, 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 a magnitude check here, if, if all of our 300 public employees and their dependents were in a care model that grew at 3.4% a year, which is what the CCOs are, that would save $5 billion out of the general fund over a decade. That's an additional $500 million a year that you could invest in education, in early childhood, in the kind of incentives that Senator Fairley early talked about. So this is a game changer. And if we can drive this into the private sector, it will be the most incredible competitive advantage for this state that we have ever known. And uh, we are going to make that happen. One of the things that, <clears throat> from the business community standpoint, and I think from the consumer standpoint in the state, over the years, uh, Oregon has always had an advantage in terms of its cost of energy, uh, which has been very important to not only the manufacturing sector, but, but many other uh, aspects of the state. So you, could you give us a few comments on your energy policy and how you see that fit with this overall advantage that we've had in, in uh, the cost structure? There's no question that the, the, that the low cost reliable energy in the, in the Pacific Northwest, obviously a big component of that is the federal hydropower system has been a huge, uh, huge economic advantage for us. One of the reasons that we uh, adopted the 10-year energy plan in December 2012 was to sort of elevate this issue. And the number one objective is to meet 100% of our new uh, demand going forward over energy conservation and, uh, uh, and energy efficiency, which also is a huge and growing uh, industry, both in R&D, 
uh, in the opportunity for putting middle income trade, uh, uh, trades back to work in, in retrofitting buildings through our cool schools program, our state building lab. So there's a huge opportunity, I think, there for uh, growing our economy while maintaining uh, the, uh, a low cost of energy. The uh, West Coast uh, Energy and Climate Action Plan that we signed with uh, the governors of California and Washington as well as the Premier of British Columbia is an effort to try to align and harmonize our uh, energy and climate policies along the West Coast, which is the fifth biggest economy in the world. I'll give you one little example. Last session, we aligned our, energy, uh, our uh, appliance energy efficiency standards with those of California. If Washington does the same thing, you will change the market almost overnight. So there's a robust opportunity for things we can do here in the state, but it's also very, very important for us to act regionally on this issue uh, because we have just huge uh, both economic and cost savings opportunities. Well, Governor, I'm getting lots of flashing red lights. So I think we've uh, outstayed our welcome, but I want to thank you very much. And, and on behalf of the business plan and, and everyone involved in it, uh, thank you so much for your support and your guidance in terms of how we get to our, our goals and objectives. Thank you very much. <laughs>